For this set of uh, lessons, we're going to have three different videos for you to watch. Uh, all of them will concern the transport of water in the xylem of plants. Uh, and this part, first part, it just introduces the main material, and the following two parts will expand upon it. So we've talked about transport in animals, uh, and we've talked about diffusion. Um, it's a short distance transport process, and it's the same sort of situation in plants. For over short distances, diffusion is used to move things around. Uh, and when I say short distances, I mean that we would have things moving either within a cell or just over a very small number of cells. And just like in animals, uh, we have longer distance movements that require different ways of getting materials uh, from place to place. We have the same sort of thing in plants where we have to move water and the things that are dissolved in it over many, many cell lengths. Now, long distance transport is not really essential in aquatic plants and non-vascular land plants. And you can see the reason for this in this next slide. Here we're looking at a, a kelp bed uh, in the ocean. And because the plants are bathed in water and all the tissues are relatively thin, there's really no need for any kind of vasculature to move things around because the plant itself is immersed in the water uh, and never has to move things more than just a few cells. Now for land plants, they're not necessarily immersed in water, but if they're small enough, diffusion is still adequate for moving things around. And so what we can see here, uh, it, here's a case of a moss, which is small enough not to require vasculature. This is uh, what is sometimes referred to as a primitive sort of plant known as a hornwort. Uh, and then over here we have a kind of algae which you can see is quite small, its, uh, its size being compared here to a dime. So these uh, just use diffusion to get things to move around inside of their bodies. But what we really want to concern ourselves with in this lesson is the long distance movement over many cell lengths. Um, and sometimes this can be pretty extreme. So, for example, here we have a picture of a redwood, the most extreme case in living plants, uh, where you could have water that needs to move almost 100 meters from the soil to the topmost leaves of the plant. And how is the plant doing that? Okay, so the first thing uh, is that you have to have evolution of some kind of vasculature to make this happen. So just as in animals you had evolution of uh, a vascular system for moving things around in blood. Uh, you have evolution of vasculature in plants to move things around. And this is very helpful because once you've got vasculature, roots can penetrate deeper into the soil so they can go down and get deeper water sources and more nutrients, uh, which makes it easier for the plants to live in places where water availability is not all that good at the surface. And the other thing that happens is now plants can begin to produce stems and raise themselves significantly above the soil. And this has some real advantages. Uh, it makes them more competitive for light, so individuals can overtop one another and use uh, light resources that are not, where they're not in competition with other individuals. It also means that they can move their flowers and fruits up in the air uh, and make them more conspicuous for pollinators and for, for seed dispersal agents. And it also helps with transport of pollen and uh, fruits and seeds that are also transported in the air because you get them up above a boundary layer of air close to the surface and then they can be carried long distances. The other thing that's good about a vasculature is it allows the plant to move nutrients to areas where they are needed. So for example, the plant might produce uh, a new leaf and that new leaf may not be self-sufficient yet. But with vasculature, it can move some of its photosynthate, some sugars, for example, out of a more mature leaf into the developing leaves, and that will increase the rate at which that new leaf can develop. All right, so let's take a look at what this looks like in a, a plant that produces wood, so some kind of a tree. On the outermost part of the plant, we have bark here. But once you move inside, there's just a very thin living layer. So you have the phloem, which is represented here in this kind of orange color. You have a vascular cambium from which you grow, the plant will grow new phloem. And then you have a very thin layer, at least in the springtime, of living xylem tissue. So the xylem tissue, at least on trees, is always 
toward the inner part of the plant. But the only part of the xylem that's living is when it's being produced early in the spring, at least for plants that are living in a temperate area. The remaining amount of wood, and all of wood is xylem, um, the remaining amount of wood is xylem that was laid down in previous years. And while it still may be transporting water, it's dead tissue. So most of the, uh, of the xylem that you see in a plant is actually dead tissue. It's been laid down in previous years. Now, in a big tree, you'll find a darker region of xylem, which is referred to as the heartwood, and that heartwood has become clogged up and is no longer transporting, uh, actively transporting water through it. And you can see here in cross-section, the xylem, the vascular cambium, and then the phloem over here. And this is a nice electron micrograph of uh, a cut through a bunch of xylem. And you can see that some of the xylem vessels are bigger and other xylem vessels are smaller. This is what produces tree rings. In the springtime, the trees generally produce much larger xylem vessels because water availability is greater. And then as the summer proceeds and water availability drops off, they start to produce these smaller vessels that you see here. All right. So there are some things we need to know about water in order to understand how plants are actually moving it up uh, a tree trunk. The first thing is that water, uh, for its size especially, has very strong cohesive and adhesive forces. Okay? So in other words, it sticks to itself very strongly and it can also adhere or stick to other things quite strongly. And what this means is that under the right conditions, particularly because of the cohesion, it allows water to be pulled along um, and therefore it can actually act like a rope. Now what do I mean by that? Let's take a look at this next slide. Water is, uh, molecules are bound to each other through hydrogen bonding. So you see here we've got a total of six different water molecules and what we're showing with these dotted lines here are the various uh, hydrogen bonds that are being formed between this central water molecule and these other five water molecules, or sorry, these other four water molecules that are surrounding it. So you can think of each uh, water molecule as like a tiny strand that you would find in a rope, and you can pull on one end of a column of water, and through those hydrogen bonds, you'll pull on all the other uh, uh, the other water molecules. And this might seem a little counterintuitive because you can't reach into a bowl, for example, and just grab the surface of the water and lift up a big rope of water. But when the water is contained inside of the vessels like are found for xylem, it becomes possible to put the, uh, the water under what we call a strong negative pressure potential and literally have it be pulled up uh, that column. You do this, for example, anytime you suck on a straw. So that water column that comes up the straw is coming up because the hydrogen bonding internally within the different uh, water molecules keep there from being breakage when you suck on that straw and the water comes up in it. Okay. Now, in addition to the fact that water can be pulled, the adhesion allows it to stick to cell walls um, and it interacts with a lot of polar molecules very uh, strongly as well and ion ionically bonded molecules. And you know about this already. For example, uh, you can take common table salt, and when you put that into water, the polar water molecules uh, align themselves around the, uh, the different uh, ions uh, from the salt, the sodium and the, uh, the chlorine, and you end up uh, having the salt dissolve uh, and be bound up within the water molecules themselves.